You're watching DF Retro, and today it's all about one thing. Roaring Star! Roaring Star! That's right, we're looking at Daytona USA and all of its iterations. This is a game that was ahead of its time, which demonstrated the importance of frame rate all the way back in 1993. There's a lot to cover here though, so let's get started. Oh! 3D graphics. These days they're taken for granted, but there was a time when they felt like nothing more than a pipe dream. From the earliest days of game development, creators have sought to deliver worlds in full 3D. Starting with simple vector-based games like Battlezone and Star Wars, developers were keen to push the boundaries of technology. In 1983, one of the first 3D polygon games, iRobot, was released and was quite impressive. But high-speed 3D was the dream. And these games simply didn't offer the same level of fluidity you could achieve in two dimensions. It was Sega's newly minted AM2 division then that was one of the first to start moving in this direction. Starting with the likes of Hang On and Space Harrier, Yu Suzuki and team set out to make history by pursuing 3D graphics at high frame rates. These super scalar titles impressed at the time with smooth scaling and an impressive sense of speed, but the games were ultimately still not true 3D. As time pushed on, we saw more 3D polygon games emerge. In 1991, Namco released Starblade, which started to show what high speed 3D might look like. It was visually simple, with flat-shaded polygons galore, but it moved smoother than most competing games, even if it was ultimately just a rail shooter. Sega and AM2 continued to move forward, however, with hardware that pushed beyond what Namco could deliver at the time with the release of Virtua Racing on the Sega Model 1 arcade board. The Model 1 was an impressive piece of technology developed internally by Sega starting in 1990, and Virtua Racing was its first outing. It was a full 3D racing game that looked and felt incredible to play. It was a cutting edge game that threw around a tremendous number of polygons per frame, at least for the time. But as impressive as it was, the game still ultimately only ran at 30 frames per second, though the 2D bitmap backgrounds actually moved at 60 frames per second, something we regularly saw on the Sega Saturn later on. Model 1 also played host to things like AM2's Virtua Fighter, the first polygonal fighting game. As impressive as all of these games could be, however, a revolution was just around the corner. Released during August 1993 in Japan, Daytona USA changed the face of 3D gaming forever. Daytona was the first game to run on Sega's Model 2 arcade board which was capable of producing results unlike anything else at the time. The board was produced jointly by Sega and GE Aerospace, which was later acquired by Martin Marietta, which would go on to merge with Lockheed, becoming Lockheed Martin. Development would continue throughout the 90s then under the Real 3D banner. But Model 2 itself was actually born out of GE's CompuScene Image Generator, a multi-million dollar creation designed to deliver real-time 3D simulations. GE demonstrated this technology to Sega, and the two companies worked in tandem to produce a truly revolutionary product. And Daytona USA utilized it brilliantly. It was a game of many firsts. For starters, it was the first game ever commercially released with actual texture filtering. It's easy to take this for granted today, but at the time, smoothing out pixelated textures was a big deal and something that we had never before seen in a real-time 3D game. It was a feature that simply was not possible on consoles, the PC, or any other arcade board. Beyond that, these textures were fully perspective correct and mapped onto a highly detailed polygon world. This was all then displayed at 496 by 384 resolution in full 16-bit color. The Model 2 board could transform upwards of 300,000 quads per second at 60 frames per second with all effects and textures on screen. The next generation of consoles, which hadn't even been released yet, would ultimately prove significantly less powerful. The quality of 3D graphics at home in 1993 was actually more along these lines though, 
To go from this to the Model 2 was truly remarkable, but more than anything else, it is the frame rate that really changed the game. Daytona USA operates at 60 frames per second locked. Well, almost. The refresh rate is actually closer to 57 hertz, so you end up with duplicate frames on a 60 hertz monitor. The situation's actually not unlike that of Mario Kart 8, in fact. This issue does not appear on the original arcade monitors, however. It looks completely smooth. This is the game responsible for awakening my sensitivity towards frame rate. Before Daytona USA, I was actually unfamiliar with the concept, but upon seeing this game running, my view on 3D graphics changed forever. This was the most fluid and impressive looking game ever made. It's difficult to imagine what it was like these days with so many games being released, but Daytona USA truly felt like a product from the future, a game running on hardware with visuals a full generation beyond anything else. It would be at least five years before you might find anything comparable on the PC, and it demonstrated just how crucial high frame rates really were. Oh, and it was a tremendously fun game as well. We can't forget that. But it wouldn't be long before Daytona USA would find a place in the living room. We are five years away from entering the 21st century. Humankind stands on the edge of the interactive age. You have come a long way. But are you ready for the future? Sega's next generation Saturn console was already available in Japan and just around the corner for North America. Its 3D arcade games were white hot at the time and it should come as no surprise that Daytona USA was set to come home. Sega Saturn. Now the development of the Saturn remains a source of frustration for many of us with its dual CPU design and difficult development environment. In an age where Sega was topping everyone in the arcades with 3D graphics, the Saturn was originally focused on 2D and ultimately felt underpowered. But even under the best of conditions, there really was never a chance that Sega Saturn could actually match a $15,000 arcade board. But keeping that in mind, the results were still disappointing. Daytona USA runs with a massive reduction in polygon count, a huge loss in texture quality, and none of the advanced visual features of its arcade counterpart. But more than anything else, Daytona USA on the Saturn demonstrated all the way back in the mid-90s just how critical frame rate really is. We've heard it time and again, people commenting on the articles and videos that we produce saying, why is it only now that frame rate matters? Why are we all obsessed with 60 frames per second? But I'm here to tell you that it has always been the case, and Daytona USA for the Saturn is a perfect example of when people realized just how important frame rate actually was. You didn't even need to know what frame rate was in order to see and feel the difference with this home port. The flawless 60 frames per second arcade original was reduced to just 20 frames per second or less. A little over a year later, Sega had a new installment in the Daytona franchise ready for the Saturn, Daytona USA Championship Circuit Edition. This particular iteration boasted improved visuals, a higher frame rate, and loads of new features. It seemed like it would be the perfect package. Unfortunately, many would argue that the game simply didn't control as well as the original release. The car handling just doesn't feel right, and as a result, the game is a whole lot clunkier to play. It was also released in Japan, later as the Circuit Edition, with somewhat improved handling and an option to use the original soundtrack, something that was lacking from the original North American and European releases. Even with these tweaks though, the handling still isn't optimal, and I've always had issues playing it well. The updated Japanese release was also somewhat transitioned over to North America as the Netlake version, and it stands as the single rarest American release for the Saturn, due to being sold online on Sega's online store only. But we're here to look at the game's visuals. When you compare it to the original game, it's clear that we're looking at a much more impressive title. Car models are smoother, textures are higher resolution, draw distance is increased, and more importantly, the frame rate is higher. But the look of the game has changed so dramatically that it does lose some of the original charm. It's a darker looking game all around with more realistic tones that feels more like a NASCAR simulation than a colorful arcade game. <laughs> 
This becomes even more evident when you stack it up against the arcade original. It's clear that the development team has a better handle on the Saturn hardware at this point, but it still just doesn't compare. Still, the game as a whole does look pretty nice, and it has a good sense of solidarity that was lacking in the original. Oh, and if you're wondering, why didn't you do a frame rate graph for this game? Well, let me explain. There's something very weird going on with this title. So as I covered in the Castlevania episode, the Saturn actually uses VDP-1 for 3D graphics and VDP-2 for 2D elements. In this case, VDP-1 displays the polygons at around 30 frames per second most of the time. But the background elements, like the skybox and the HUD, actually update at a different frame rate, and in fact exhibit screen tearing which is extremely weird, so you actually get torn frames in the sky while the rest of the game operates with V-Sync. It's just another quirk of the system, but it basically makes FPS analysis impossible here. And Daytona CE was also released for the PC in 1997. This version shares a lot with the Saturn game, but was also patched to support Direct3D, enabling PC users to play the game with texture filtering, bringing it somewhat closer to the arcade release. Of course, it still ultimately looks more like the Saturn version, which is what it was based on, as opposed to the Model 2 original, but it's neat to see anyways. It's also nice that the game still runs natively on a modern operating system. I'm running this version from a Windows 10 PC. The fact that the very top of the image is cut off stands is one of the only real issues with it though. It's really kind of surprising considering that many PC games from this era just don't play well with modern operating systems. At this point, we're still five years out from the original release of Daytona USA, but there still isn't anything on a home platform that could truly match it. 3D cards were taking off in the PC space and the Dreamcast was on the horizon, but there really wasn't a single game available on a home platform that could match the solidarity and performance levels of Daytona USA. But outside the home, things were about to heat up. <laughs> That's right, Daytona USA made a return in Daytona 2 Battle on the Edge. This time, the game was powered by Sega's remarkable Model 3 hardware, which once again raised the bar in terms of what you'd expect from 3D graphics hardware of the day. Daytona 2 offers more detailed environments free of noticeable poppin', with a hugely boosted polygon count, higher resolution textures all around, and more advanced effects. It runs at the same resolution as other Model 2 games, however, but presents so much more detail. The game didn't draw quite as much attention as the original, unfortunately, but I think it's still one of the finest arcade racing games ever made. I mean, just look at this. This is a game from 1998, a year when the most cutting-edge racers on the PC looked more like this. Sure, Need for Speed 3 Hot Pursuit was definitely a nice-looking PC game at the time, especially on something like a Voodoo card, but when you compare it to Daytona 2, it looked kind of a generation behind. Unfortunately, the incredibly impressive Daytona 2 never actually made it home, even when hardware was powerful enough to handle it. Though there was at least some hope on the horizon. In 2001, Daytona USA returned to North America at a full 60 frames per second on consoles for the very first time, only on Sega Dreamcast. Unfortunately, Daytona 2001 wasn't exactly what fans had expected or were looking for. It was a remake of sorts designed to deliver a Daytona-like experience but with all new graphics and new features. And it does look great, but it doesn't quite play as well as many would have liked. The controls feel twitchy and less refined than the arcade games, especially in comparison to Daytona 2 which was simply perfect. It doesn't even play as smoothly as the much choppier Sega Saturn versions of Daytona. This version was actually a joint project between Amusement Vision and Genki, the team responsible for the Shutoku Battle Games, also known as Tokyo Extreme Racer, on the Dreamcast. The same team that helped port Virtua Fighter 3 TB to the system. Visually speaking, it does at least compare favorably with the arcade original, with increased geometric detail, higher resolution textures, better lighting, and more. Now, at this point, Daytona USA had been available for eight years and still had yet to reach home in perfect condition. Would we ever receive an arcade perfect port of Daytona USA at home? 
Before we get there, we have to make a brief pit stop here in 2009. Sega released Sega Racing Classic, which hit the arcades as a rebirth of the original Daytona USA, only without the license. All references to the license were removed from both the game and the music, and while this version runs on more powerful hardware known as the Ringwide, the visuals actually remain mostly unchanged, outside of running at 720p in 16x9 mode. Ten years after the release of Daytona on Dreamcast, the heat returned home once more, and finally, after all this time, Sega fully delivered. Daytona USA was released on PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360, and it offered everything you could have wanted and more. This was arcade perfection, or more like arcade evolved. This version of Daytona matched the arcade version visually while operating at a full 1080p. It was glorious. If I had to nitpick though, I might point out that using MIP maps here with poor filtering does somewhat change the look of the game, but ultimately, this is still a brilliant looking port. It's only a shame that Sega didn't go even further here and release its Model 3 games, such as Daytona 2 on home consoles, but hey, this is great stuff as it is. And it remains the final version of Daytona USA ever officially released by Sega. So what can we take away from this journey beneath the blue, blue skies? Well, first and foremost, Daytona USA demonstrates just how important a rock-solid frame rate is when it comes to preservation. Performance impacts the longevity of a game. This is a title from 1993, for instance, and it still holds up beautifully and plays like a dream, and a lot of this is the result of its blistering frame rate. And when it came home on the Saturn, the low frame rate there clearly demonstrated value in targeting the high frame rate. Even back in the day, frame rate mattered, and it continues to matter. But with that, we've reached the end of another DF Retro. I hope you enjoyed this trip down memory lane as much as I have, and if you enjoyed it, be sure to let us know by liking, subscribing, and hitting us up on Twitter. Now if you'll excuse me, it's time to hit the track once again, but until next time, Stay retro. Bye.